across this all these things. This conference will now be recorded. That, it links you to, uh, I don't think it's Data Haven, but I think it's something called Data Profile. Um, okay. There's one of the data okay. sources on there. Okay, yeah, that should be explained somewhere. Yeah, thank you. And then you have another table, I think it was the disability table. Um, you use 2,000 census data? That that could be a typo or something. It's a 19 no, I think there there is some old data that I was able to parse out. Uh, so I'll go back and check it out, uh, yeah. make notes here. Okay. Thank you for your keen eye, Beth. Hi, Liz. Hi, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Good, thanks. Liz, are you doing in-person meetings? Um, we are, but only at lease up or inspection for extenuating circumstances. For the most part, we're doing everything through the mail yep. or a Dropbox. Well, I'd like to pick your brain for a while, so I'm wondering if uh, what would be the preferred method for you? Hi, Chris. Whatever works for you. Well, I could, do a, I could do a Zoom, I can come down, but I think if you're not comfortable with coming down and social distancing and all the other stuff a zoom call would be would be fine for me if that would work for you no you can actually come down it's we're just not uh, meeting with large groups and no. um we're cautious as to who we're inviting in understood yeah. well i just think um i don't know that there's things that we're going to be sharing some pictures and stuff like that you know we may scribble some things out or whatever but just um Pick your brain would be very uh, helpful to me. So I'll reach out to you after tonight's meeting and we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, oh, um, Chris, I'm sorry I couldn't get to your uh, bylaws draft. I was out yesterday and today I had no access to email. Our servers are migrating, um, so I didn't have remote access as well. But I've, uh, okay. I spoke to Jay this afternoon and he told me that um, you discussed with him briefly as well. Yeah, and I sent it out to all the members. So, um, you know, if people are comfortable taking that up, we can deal with it. If not, we can table it till next week or next meeting, whatever works for you guys. Hi guys, I'm on the call, Mary here. Hi Mary. 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 Okay, let me just wanna, have you done a roll call yet to see who's here? The mayor is in transit now, I believe, um, leaving town hall. So uh, she, she'll be on a few minutes late, I think. Okay. No worries okay, at all. thank you, Mary. All right, so, all right. Uh, let me just start, see who's here, see if we have a quorum. Uh, Susmita, you're here. Christopher Blake, I see here. you're here. Beth DePonte's here. Desmond. Um, actually, he might have been the one that sent that accidental cancellation. Uh, <laughs> okay, Jennifer Shelton. Okay, I'm here. Elizabeth, you're here. I'm here. And Harold Watson. Not here. So we have one, two, three. Four. We actually need one more person in order to actually start. I'll text Harold. Okay. Hi, this is Desmond. I'm on. Who's that? This is Desmond. Oh, hi, Desmond. Okay, good. Okay, that's five, actually. Cool. One quick second. Hi, Laura. Hi. Come here. 
Hey, Jennifer. Hi, how is everyone? Good. Okay. I just texted uh, Harold and I'm waiting for him to respond. Okay. But we have a quorum, right, Chris? Yes, we do. Let, can, can we start? My time's pretty limited. Okay, certainly. Okay, a call to order the meeting of the Stratford Hards in partnership at 6.04 p.m. Um, the first item of business is actually the organizational function, which is adoption of the bylaws. I know I sent it out only a few hours ago. I don't know if members have seen it and if they're comfortable taking it up right now. It's pretty motion to accept the bylaws as sent out. I'm sorry? I'm making a motion to approve the bylaws. Okay, motion to accept the bylaws by Beth DePonte. Is there a second? Second by Laura Hoydick. Second by Laura Hoydick. Any discussion, corrections, amendments? We can always update them later too. If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It carries unanimously. Uh, the bylaws are adopted. Uh, election of the chair. Do I hear any nominations? I'd like to make a motion to nominate. I'd like to make a motion to nominate Crystal Havy as chair, please. Okay, motion to nominate Crystal Havy as chair. Is there a second? I'll Laura second. Hoydick would like to second. A second by Mayor Hoydick. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Appreciate the vote of confidence. Uh, the floor is now open for the election of a vice chair. Mr. Mr. Chair, it's Laura Hoyding. I would like to nominate Jen Shelton as vice chair. We'd like to nominate Jen Shelton. We have a nomination for Jen Shelton by Laura Hoydick. Uh, is there a second to the nomination? I'll second Liz Sulek. Second by Elizabeth Sulek. Are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? If not, all in favor of uh, Jen Shelton as vice chair, say aye. 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 If not, uh, any opposed? Carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. So we will express that. Congratulations. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, next thing is uh, discussion among members on the following. Uh, there are four questions listed in section two. Was the information presented at the July 8th meeting helpful? What do you feel are the key housing issues of Stratford? What do you feel are the main needs of the community? And how do you feel about our housing strategies and what they should be for the future? Um, so I guess this is basically a period of open discussion. So let's go around the, our Brady Bunch squares and uh, we'll talk it through. Anybody want to go first or I'll just pick people randomly? Okay. Well, then I guess I'll just, Christopher Blake, why don't you say, uh, oh, Glenn, you want to start can, something? If I can jump in just for a sec, Chris. Sure. I, I think what I'm hoping to do here is to get your thoughts and feedback on some of the housing issues that you're aware of in the community. I think as part of booklet two, in the, in the very back of booklet two was this uh, matrix, mm -hmm. which sort of explained uh, different income levels, different age groups. Um, and there's people within those age groups that have different housing needs. And so uh, I'm looking for your feedback and thoughts on whether the information was useful um, and how we might uh, use uh, your experiences in town, your knowledge, familiarity with the community to start thinking about housing needs and start to establish a framework for moving forward. So that's that's what I'm looking forward to getting from tonight's meeting. So Chris, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, well, Seth. I'm a little embarrassed. I was not part of the last meeting. So um, I do have the information in front of me that I breezed through last night and tonight and this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the housing needs in Stratford, um, what, I would, what I would like to see is people um, coming into this town in a young, at a younger age, people that are going to build families here. Um, I know that's that could be taxing on our school system and such, but 
that that's where I see kind of the future is. Um, I'm not really familiar with the legality of affordable housing. I'm still learning about that, so I don't have a lot of input on that. But I'd like to see the, the, the town become more family oriented. I, I know there, there are family and, and good good um, neighborhoods here now, but I'd like to maintain and build off of that. And it, it appear, appears like uh, through some real estate friends that a lot of New York is heading towards Connecticut. Uh, there might be a, an opportunity for some young U New Yorkers who are, who are now learning that they can work from Stratford, Connecticut in Manhattan without the commute, you know, tele telecommuting and build their families here. I think that would be outstanding. Okay. Uh, Beth, you want to go next? Sure. Um, so in reading the report, I think that we need to be really careful with what with what data are used and how that data is used. Um, you know, so things are sourced a bit better, but not perfectly. And, uh, and, and, and there isn't a discussion about the uncertainty in the estimates that are provided. Um, it's just, you know, we're giving point estimates, not a lot of nuances to it. Using uh, Bridgeport income, in any of the calculations makes us look like we have more of an affordable housing problem than we have. And I think, Glenn, uh, your firm needs to be more creative on what to do about that. We need to make sure that the data are about Stratford and speaks to Stratford. That being said, um, there are things that we can draw from the information and from national and regional trends. And one is the aging of the population. And there simply isn't enough housing that I know of that, that a senior citizen who sells their you know, $300,000, quarter of a million dollar home to downsize and wants to move into a handicapped accessible apartment, there just isn't that very much housing. There are just a couple of places uh, where such a person um, could could live in town. And so I think our attention really should be on the senior population. There already is a lot of housing for people who are able-bodied. There isn't a lot of housing for people who are disabled and also for people who don't want the responsibilities of having to uh, take care of a house, um, who aren't able to take care of a house and want more of a condominium situation uh, that's handicapped accessible. And there are only, I think, there are only a few buildings in town uh, that have that sort of accessibility. So in terms of what sort of, you know, if we were to say that Stratford needs more housing, um, that's the area that I think we should go in. And that would free up housing, the, the sort of family housing um, that, that people have raised their families in and they're ready to move on to a different situation. So by, by being able to churn to be, being able to move somewhere else, invest in a different type of housing situation that will open up those homes that are family friendly. Um, and so, so I, I, I think that's where we should be thinking. And in terms of having that sort of development or, or rehabilitation, uh, we should also be thinking about um, non-car transportation that's available for the seniors, be it short walks or um, or, or or other sort of uh, of, of ways that they could be, that they can uh, use to get to, from one place to another. So I think that I'll, I'll stop there. But thank you. Thanks, Beth. Okay, Elizabeth, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I agree with a lot of what Beth is saying, um, only based on from where I sit. Uh, we see a lot of elderly uh, folks who have lived in Stratford, a lot of them their whole lives, and now that they're retired, they simply can't afford to, to remain in their homes. They can't afford it because it's too costly. So even though most don't have a mortgage, they still can't afford the taxes, the insurance, and the upkeep. Um, so a lot of them wind up in where I work in public housing. Um, the unfortunate part about the programs that we administer is that 
in our state portfolio, um, we have to accept senior or disabled. So in our state property, it's almost 50-50 on how many seniors we have and how many disabled, young disabled we have. And by young disabled, I mean anyone under 62 years of age. Those two populations don't live well together. So what I would like to see is more true senior housing um, and, and accessibility. I would love it to be by a trail so they can walk or accessible to a walk-in. So, you know, if their doctor was cross town and they needed immediate care, they could go to a walk-in, um, perhaps to a bus route so they could get to, you know, their wherever they worship, churches, synagogues, um, and perhaps a mom and pop grocery store conveniently located. That would be an ideal situation. <clears throat> so I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, future planning, um, I think we, if there was a location that opened up, we would have to put our heads together and make it accessible and attractive to attract those seniors who have money, want to live independently, um, but can't afford to do it in their own homes. So. Okay. Um, Desmond, do you want to offer some thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, so what I what I see um, uh, on the matter is uh, kind of echoing from what has been said before. Uh, Stratford, I see Stratford as a transitionary town. Um, you have a lot of people that moving from out of town into Stratford as stepping stone usually is what I see from a real estate development and a realtor standpoint. And then sometimes they'll move into another town, um, but they may not be able to get to that town yet, but they they want to stop in Stratford. So um, when you talk about those people stopping here, how do we make, how, how do we make Stratford housing affordable for them? And one of the points that's been brought before is if you have seniors that don't have a place to go because they've lived there for a long time, um, you have a bottleneck. And if those folks have some affordable housing that they can move um, into, it creates an opening for some of those other people to be able to, uh, to come into town. And so for primarily what I've always seen is Stratford, um, a lot of people want to come into Stratford, but they don't have anywhere to go in Stratford. Stratford historically has had low inventory of housing available um, at many, many ranges. So one of the things that helps with that is if you have a place for seniors to go, like what's been mentioned, or if you have um, uh, even more multifamilies, younger families that want to move into Stratford may not be able to buy a single family at ha Stratford uh, prices, but they would gladly live you know, in some multifamily dwelling. Um, but even those are very low um, supply base, um, in historically for the last couple of years. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things there that we need to chase to provide the uh, inventory for people to be able to live here. And um, I think that's one of the challenges that we have to solve for in this group. Uh, there's There's just not enough for the flow of people that are coming in. You know, it's kind of like the bottle. And how do we how do we kind of relieve that 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 bottleneck? Okay, uh, Madam Mayor, you want to add anything in? Well, let's see. Sure, thank you. Um, I am very concerned with the data, and we talked we talked about it last meeting, so I won't beat a dead horse on this. But I just want to make sure that while we are looking at the regional and the county data. We're also, and the neighboring counties, since it's separated, New Haven separated by a river. Um, I want to make sure that we're really identifying the data that's Stratford specific. When I was reading the packet, you know, I had to get, keep going back and referencing the, the date, whether it was 2010 or where it was, because the numbers that I see are very different 
but some of it are different than what are, is presented. So that's why I had to keep going back to that and looking at when, what, where the source was and what the dates for the source was. Um, I want to see housing that leads or lends us to a more a vibrant and accessible community. Um, affordable, but not necessarily 8-30G affordable. You know, affordable where someone, as Desmond said, if they want to buy a starter home here um, and then they can move to something else. I, I want people that want to live here because they think the district, is, the school district is good or they like the diversity in the town or the town has a lot of amenity to, amenities to offer. 80% um, of the grand list is residential. I am not interested really in having it go down to 75% of residential because we have so much nonprofit housing available. Um, I would only consider more multifamily if it was a planned and managed housing um, development. Because again, the reason the Zoning Commission years ago stopped the multifamily housing was because it was we were getting overrun with absentee landlords um, and and it was very, very difficult to keep the quality of the homes up up to where well, where, where there was a personal interest and a pride. And that to me is really important in this community because we work so hard together on so many things. I would hate to have an influx, and we are right now, we're experiencing it just because of the market and also because possibly because of the pandemic, but I think it's also, this was happening before the pandemic. Um, the market makes us attractive because we are already affordable, especially in Fairfield County. We are um, the best game in town. And people who feel maybe feel that the schools aren't as great as they could be can still afford to move here, get all the amenities for their taxes as well, and then send their children to private school. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, I'll echo that from what I see is Stratford is the first is it's the first best stop if you're coming from New York, right? Affordable wise. Um, they're not gonna stop in Stanford, because I see this to the folks that I, I work with, they're not gonna stop in Stanford or Norwalk or Fairfield and they don't want to be in Bridgeport. So Stratford is that first kind of checks all the boxes for them. And so we have an opportunity to attract good working class, making good money folks. Um, and keep them here if, if we if we get it right. Okay, Harold, did I see that you joined us? Sure. Yes, I did. Sorry, I was late. Um, no worries. I, I essentially agree with a lot of what I've heard here. I chose Stratford to retire to, so I am the, you know. The, the, I can actually comment about some of my reasons for choosing Stratford. I wanted a neighborhood of single family homes. I wanted a house that wasn't much bigger than my parents when they built their GI Bill house, which was about 1300 square feet when they put an addition on it. Uh, all the kind of things that I wanted, I found here in Stratford. <clears throat> and I found it to be a really good buy. And I loved the idea of living in a tree lined single home community where I could actually meet my neighbors. Now, my apartment in Manhattan was 800 square feet and sold for $1.2 million. So I've de-escalated that as I've grown my uh, square feet. But I'm also getting older now, and I'm saying what Beth was talking about. I need to make sure that I can accommodate myself in this house. I bought it with that intention in mind. But having dealt with my partner with cancer, I discovered there are lots more things that I really do need to do in order to stay here. So I think one of the things that the town could do is actually develop a program specifically for that. And I know that we do have some of those assets in line, but I think we could also develop it kind of the way that uh, AARP does with some of their programming as a real honest to God program that real estate agents could use to pitch and the town could look into in terms of supporting. I think that would be something that would help us bring in people like me. I can afford to pay my taxes. I can afford to pay my expenses here. I certainly am above the median income. So I'm the ideal candidate for a lot of these homes. But let me really speak to my true uh, 
heart here. And I, I will stay here until I can't live here. So what Beth was saying is at some point I might need a small 750 square foot house that's you know a condo basically that I can have a an aid to support me and all of that. There might come a time for that in the next decade. Hopefully not, but we'll see. I'm very interested in how we are changing though. I know that my friends from the Bronx who've come down to look feel like this is the dream town and it is in many ways. Um, and I know that we've been selling like hot fire and so many of the new neighbors in my immediate neighborhood, six block radius, all have New York City, New York State tags, <clears throat> which leads me to believe that we're getting people in the in the near New York City suburbs. We're getting, a, I know we're getting people from the Bronx because I've spoken to some of them about that. And they all, for the most part, have young families. Where we cut ourselves short is the ability, someone mentioned it, Desmond, I think you did, the ability to have multi-generational families in a house um, is a cultural difference. It's not, it, it is, right now it's culturally different. When I was a kid, it was no different. My grandparents and <laughs> we all lived multi-generation in the same house, but it hasn't been that way for the last 25 years. But to a lot of particularly immigrant families, they are multi-generational. So they do need the square footage and they can oftentimes, while their individual incomes are not high, their group income is high enough to support any of the houses here. And I believe they have as much pride of ownership as you know any, anybody else buying in our neighborhood. Um, so I think that that's something that really should be very carefully considered. Also is something that we have to offer. And I think particularly with our existing two family homes, which from my days of canvassing the streets are our most un underdeveloped housing that we have in this town. Uh, they've become, most of them are, are uncared for. And I know from friends who just looked for an apartment, they ended up moving to Milford because they could not find any nice housing for a reasonable price. So if we're talking, uh, you know, the $1,300 a month range, you should be able to get that. That's $2,600 mortgage for a two family house. That is within the realm of anything. If we can get people to purchase those properties and renovate them, then that also is something that we can support and, and move forward with, even if it's only our existing two family stock, that it really should be looked at very carefully. Um, the other thing that I looked at that no one has mentioned here that I, I cannot let slip by, uh, last year at this time, Stratford was dealing with about 10 foreclosures. But right now, currently, on the books, we have 125 uh, residential units. I just looked it up on the court register today. 125 units, which is a huge increase of those. We, we are gonna have to be involved with it at some point, which could either be a way of keeping those people in their homes or coming stepping in and using those to create an affordable housing mix. Uh, the other thing is that they're, they're estimating that evictions, which last year was about 4%, will go up somewhere between 7 and 14% by the end of the year. Now, I know that they're talking about having forgiveness and everything else in the way, but either of those two things could change <coughs> everybody's, every town's housing stock, but that would have a huge impact on what we are trying to do here. My final comment is that I looked into in the voters database and found out that vote registered voters are, are about 25,000 people, uh, about 25,000 white people. All other brings us up to about 35,9. So that says to me that our minorities have grown significantly based on the 2010 2015 data that we have, which does does change a lot in terms of if we're talking about building an affordable housing matrix that we really should have at least the proportions of population here 
if we can get fresh data, it would make a huge difference. Because I think it, the change is going to be all the new purchases that are taking place in this town. Um, a large portion of those are going to be minority families. Um, my final comment was, I think that was my final comment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Harold. Okay, no worries at all. Anybody else that I missed before I offer my comments? Um, it's Chris. Mary Dean here. Um, Hi, Mary. Yep, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I really loved, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the comments, um, senior housing and having the non-vehicle transportation, easily easy access. And I thought, I think it was Desmond's point that, you know, for the seniors, if they have a place to go and they can put their house on the market, that opens up the inventory for the young families to come in. So um, I definitely, you know, I just want to um, echo the senior, um, the, the need for the seniors here. And I love the idea. Um, I think it was the mayor that said, you know, having a vibrant and accessible uh, community. And so, you know, I wonder about some of these young professionals that are maybe leaving the city paying huge leases and can possibly purchase here in Stratford and afford to. And then, you know, as young professionals, and then maybe, you know, they move into the homes as they grow and they have families. So I think that I'd love to see, you know, the ability to be able to house young professionals well as the senior population that we really need. And I know I can speak to that personally. My parents shouldn't be in their house anymore and they need to have a place to go that's easily accessible for them to get around, but that's much smaller and on one level. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, it's Jennifer. I don't really have anything um, you know, that hasn't been mentioned by anyone else, I agree with everything, particularly the, the senior housing piece of it and, you know, being able to attract uh, young professionals. I know a lot of folks recently who moved out of the city and have and have purchased or rented uh, places in Milford because they couldn't find anything, um, you know, that, that they felt was comparable to what they were, the amenities and things they were giving up in the city. So I think, uh, I think that's definitely, you know, if we want to keep the city, the town young and, and vibrant, we need to be able to attract those folks as well. Okay. All right. Uh, let me add a couple thoughts here. Um, thank you, everybody, for your, for your comments. I think, uh, you know, everybody covered a lot, and I'm going to agree, um, especially with the data portion of this. Um, I really think we need to, priority one, is to make sure that we have a documented, um, truthful, and accurate and up-to-date assessment of where we actually are in the housing, not just through casual observation, uh, maybe not even through real estate, um, but make sure that we can prove our case, whether it as far as the housing stock is concerned, whether we actually, I remember going through the meeting the other, a few weeks ago and actually wondering, geez, with the number of vacant, uh, unoccupied housing, as it was mentioned in the, in the, in the booklet, you know, do we have too much, you know, or do we have a surplus, uh, quite a bit different than, you know, the, the perception that we were short of it. And I mean, maybe perhaps it's not, um, it's not suiting the market that's out there. Obviously, this is much of this is market driven, and I, th I think we're going to have to be. Um, it's amazing how a couple months changes so many things that the the whole New York thing, and, and I know many speakers have brought that up, um, is probably going to change the way we approach things um, because I, I I know just my own observation in the last couple of weeks. I know. A friend of mine sold his house, and they were from the Bronx. Another person I was talking to, they're moving, older couple, moving to South Carolina, and their new, uh, the people they sold it to, also from New York State. So, and yes, I've seen a lot of those orange and blue license plates running around here uh, on the street these days. You can't, can't really miss it. So, 
there's going to be a new group of people that are probably going to have their own um, uh, desires for what a community is going to be able to offer. And that's probably going to be steering things, assuming this stays, stays the way it is for some time. Um, and I think we need to be realistic about that as well as other changes that are happening. Um, you know, if this continues for some time and we are a less uh, commuting population, either through to Stanford or New York or up through the Hartford line now and people are working at home, you know, this might be an opportunity for those places where somebody might not need a two bedrooms, but they want one as a home office. Um, you know, so there's probably going to be some additional uh, changes that are going on. More the issue then of, you know, understanding where we are is also, and, and I come to this from a zoning perspective in many ways, as many of you know, uh, is how we handle things like 8-30G. You know, to the person who just looks at a statistic, they will say, well, Strafford, you're, you're way off and getting worse as far as affordable housing is concerned. And we know that that's probably the case. And, you know, we need to be able to make our case that we have of what we have, whatever that actually is. So I want to make sure we have an accurate inventory of that going forward. And it may also come just looking even further ahead. Um, and, and I'm not, this is not a political statement, just a, uh, a situation that we may be facing. Uh, the current uh, administration, Housing and Urban Development Department, um, has probably been a little bit less hands on than the previous administration. And if there's a changeover in Washington again, uh, you may find that there is more uh, uh, taking a look at town zoning regulations. There was a famous case during the Obama administration with Westchester County, where the federal government was now asking about their, uh, their uh, zoning regulations and how they conform to the goals that that department had under that. So that may, there may be a change over there that we have to be prepared for. So having our housing stock accurately documented i think is is part one and then i think and this last question says it very well housing strategies okay here's what we have and strategy i think is also going to be defined as how do we want stratford to uh evolve you know what is it going to be like and I want to make sure that we as a partnership and those of us that, that wear multiple hats, uh, you know, in different positions of leadership, um, we are proactive uh, with what we do. Um, one thing that sometimes get, can get a little irritating on the zoning board uh, is that you're very reactive. Uh, a, a developer will come and say, well, I want to build, you know, a thousand units of of, of housing and we'll have uh, or we'll, that's thousand, a little bit of an, of an exaggeration so we want to build 100 units of housing 10 of them are going to be affordable here's my proposal when when you want the public hearing and and then we are then in a reactive mode to their proposal to state laws it's not like we're setting our own destiny as to how we want to do things and some of this is out of our control market forces legal regulations and so on but if we're going to develop an, a strategy, I want to, uh, my, my hope is that it is something where it's Stratford saying, okay, these are, you know, we want to be a bedroom community. We want to be a senior community. We want to be a whatever, come up with something else. But, you know, let's make sure that we're setting our own destiny, taking care of our needs that we can identify. And I'm glad to hear a lot of folks talking about senior housing. That's very important. Um, you know, let's make sure that we are creating a strategy where, um, you know, that is attainable and we are proactive in every possible way. Okay. Could I? Could I? Sure. Somebody wanted to speak? I'm, I, if you want to speak, I can see some of you, but not all of you. So uh, just say, Mr. Chairman, or, you know. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, this reminds me, and, and I know that our mayor knows a lot about this. Um, ARP has a whole program for livable communities specifically intended for senior seniors. And one of the philosophies of it is that you try to integrate those communities into your community. So you're not building villages outside of your community. You actually are trying to put them in the middle of your community so that you end up with a multi-generational 
mix all the time. Because I'll tell you quite honestly, from this senior's point of view, I don't want to be with a bunch of other seniors. I like being with people younger than me. Um, and I would like to see that happening. So I will just bounce this back to uh, our mayor and see, I know that you have connections with them. Maybe they could help us in this area. Uh, I actually know that they do have a grant program that this might be something that they would really uh, be supportive of. Harold, you're too modest. Tell everybody who your nephew is. My nephew is one of the senior <laughs> vice presidents of AARP. And he specifically, oh, he's he, he, he works on livable communities. Um, so, and, he, uh, and Harold, he is wonderful. He is, he is great. He's my genes, but everything else is his wonder. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we got some, some resources here. Yeah, that's good to know. Do it. My, my daughter, where she went to college, lived, in, um, they had a geriatric component to their university, and they had um, an on-site living environment that they incorporated and learned from. And it was really, as Harold said, it was very, very stimulating for everyone. It was not, you think being with younger people is stimulating for older people? Well, let me just tell you the, the commonsensical manners and the life history and the experience of older adults for young, young college students or, you know, college graduates was very rewarding. It was a, a mutually beneficial relationship. So I, I think that's a great idea to bring forward, Harold. I, I second that. This is Desmond. I, um, I went to school in Vermont, Burlington, to be specific. And uh, oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, it, it bigger, bigger city, town, whatever you want to call it. But but having that intermix and and you know, kind of cohesive sharing of experiences and, and perspectives amongst the older and the younger folks and college grads and college students was was a beautiful thing. Um, I feel like Stratford, again, I'm a New York transplant as well, um, but I love Stratford because it offers so much. A lot of people end up here for the same reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we have an awesome opportunity to, to, to do exactly what you mentioned there, Harold. I think many young folks who probably want to be around older folks and vice versa you know it, you know if you had a like a vibrant downtown with the opportunity that we have there around the train station i think those are all avenues that we can make uh make some some great progress with yeah Okay. Um, Glenn, do you want to, um, I guess the next part of the agenda is actually yours. Do you want to address some of the comments that have come up from the partnership? No, I think this is very, very helpful for me because as, as people are mentioning thoughts and ideas, I'm thinking of ways that we can uh, address those. And I think, as you said, Chris, in an affirmative way, type of process, a proactive way to address some of these issues. And I think there's other community development objectives that people have kind of touched on a little bit, multi-generational neighborhoods that attract a lot of people are vibrant and active, a stronger downtown. I think these are things that we can continue to build on, not necessarily that we're, we're just focusing on housing by itself, but really the issue is how do we make Stratford a more vibrant, vital community and, and, and make it even stronger? So. In, in picking up on, on uh, Harold's remarks, it's a livable community really for everybody. So I think there are ways that we can do things with the existing housing stock, but we're probably going to have to look at ways to try to encourage new growth or new development and changes. And I've been reading in the paper some of the uh, development issues in the past, and it does seem there are times that new development becomes a full contact sport in Stratford. So are there development <laughs> guidelines that you might be able to share with me in terms of if we're going to try to address housing needs, it probably does involve changes. Stratford is is predominantly built out. I mean, there might be some sites left, but not a lot. But are there a areas or places or, or approaches that you think uh, might be uh, more well-received or that the partnership would be more comfortable 
uh, proposing, addressing, or suggesting? I do. If I can continue, if I'm talking too much, someone tell me to stop. No, Glenn, keep going. You um, have two hours. You got plenty of time. We had, we had. Uh, actually, it was under Chris when he was doing, uh, when he was planning chair. Still, I believe we put into, or we gave our approval to the Connecticut's uh, accessory apartment zoning change, which mm -hmm. allows people of need has to be a family member to build a secondary dwelling in the backyard as close as up to their property line. And one of the critical things that made it affordable is that they do not have to have a separate sewer system or even electric system. They can use, they can hook up to the houses and there's a limit, I think, to the size of the dwelling that it can be. I think it's 900 square feet or something of that sort. So it's basically, it's one of the, you know, the mini houses that you see on all of the, all of the do-it-yourself TV shows. But that's another thing that would, I think, would go to the heart of multi-generational housing. And that would go to the heart of what Beth was even saying about we need places for our elders to be able to stay comfortably. Mm -hmm. I mean, those kind of things where, you know, if we could actually promote that, right now it's on the books, but we're not doing anything to promote it. We should try to find a way to get a test case and then allow them to let us use that as an advertising thing. Because I think that we could be done, that could be done without visibly destructing our neighborhoods, without creating huge upheavals, especially at least not the upheavals that we have when we put in large apartment buildings. So that would be another way of of redeveloping our existing neighborhoods without destroying their character or without without changing their character too radically, which is the very reason that people want that neighborhood to begin with. So I think that's one of the things that we should look at. And I'm bringing you this because one of my planning members specifically asked me to bring this information to you. Um, I think accessory apartments are a great way to address a lot of different sorts of housing needs. And I think if I'm uh, understanding the legislation you talked about specifically, Harold, it was a, a statutory authorization for what started to be called granny pods. And granny pods are basically a temporary living unit that gets put into the backyard for the time that you need it, and then it gets removed later. So it's a short-term health-related type of scenario. There are but a there lot of no years. If it went on for ten years, it could stay there. Yeah, as long oh, as absolutely. it's being used. There is a, a, a provision in the legislation which, which requires an audit and a health care assessment. So the the bottom line is is that presumably you lose your ability to have it if your health situation either improves or um, it's no longer needed. There are a number of towns that have done a lot with accessory apartments, and there are three flavors that communities uh, talk about accessory apartments that are either within a home, attached to a home, so that they really appear to be part of the home, and then detached. And I think we can take a look at your regulations and, and come up with suggestions, if you will, to start to, to do that. Because even some of the scenarios that people were talking about, people who are living in their homes, and I think it was Liz who brought it up, are struggling a little bit to afford it, and it, they may have more space than they need. They can actually use the income, and somebody gets a, a living unit that person also mows the grass or shovels the walkway. So there are ways that we can meet different needs at different times um, and allow a house to be more than just one flavor. So I'll take a look at, at that. Thank you for bringing that up, Harold. Uh, Beth, I see your hand up or, and then. Uh, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm actually dealing with a situation in my neighborhood where it seems like there's uh, some of that going on and frankly I'm a neighbor and not too happy about it because it is changing the character of at least this small area uh, and, and it's not what I was referring to I was referring to having places for if seniors want to sell their homes that they actually have nice uh, apartments that are available them to them to move into or a nice yep. residence that's handicapped accessible one floor living and that's what we have, I think, a real shortage of. The communities, um, for example, we have Tide Harbor 
on Elm Street overlooking the river, um, those apartments are generally pretty desirable to, to that population. Even though it's not technically a senior community, there are so many seniors that live there uh, that, you know, it's become, yeah, the, the Baldwin Center, for example, has, has a regular stop there. Uh, so it's be, it, it, it has naturally become in some ways a senior community. But I think that's where our focus needs to be, not in allowing people to, I mean, multi-generational housing sounds nice, but if you tell me that when I buy a place that my neighbor might put in another apartment in their backyard, um, I don't think I'd be too happy about that. Uh, you know, I'd like to know uh, that the how that the neighborhood I'm moving into is uh, that uh, that that housing stock isn't going to change much on the outside. And then, you know, chopping houses up into little apartments here and there. Um, again, I don't think that that does Stratford any favors. I think the real problem is that seniors in Stratford uh, who have equity and should not or should not be living in their homes anymore or cannot for some reason. They don't have anywhere to go if they want to stay in town. Their choices are very, very limited right now. Ms. Mita, I saw your hand. Yes, um, I just wanted to add that um, after I joined office here in 2018, October, to date, I had at least four or five um, families reach out and ask if they can have a detached accessory um, unit in their backyard because their lot loves it and if their daughter or their you know son's family can move into that because you know now they they want their own space but they don't want uh, to live far away so that they can help uh, the mother uh, in the unit so we've received quite a few requests but uh, you know I don't think we have detached ac accessory apartments right now in our regulations um the other thing I also want to say um, is that um, one concern uh, from a planning standpoint that I want to bring before Glenn is um, instead of having uh, low income development separately, if there is a way we can intersperse uh, income levels into uh, communities and having some deed restrictions probably um, so that you know it is not as threatening uh, to the general public. Uh, because when you uh, when a new development that is a dash 30G comes before um, planning or zoning commissions, the main concern is traffic or schools or you know how it impacts the neighborhood. But if uh, how about we think about it differently, so that you know it it is not as striking uh, and as it's there's not as much opposition to it. I think that type of approach is sometimes called inclusionary zoning. And there are a number mm -hmm. of different ways that, that that can be addressed. And I'll put together some options so we can talk about those. Thank you, Samantha. Um, Beth, I saw your hand. Yeah, I just want to say, um, yes, uh, sometimes uh, new developments do become contact sport in Stratford. I don't think that senior housing is as threatening uh, to many people as other types of new housing. If I put a developer's hat on anybody in terms of a location that you think would be preferable, ideal, multifamily or elderly specific housing, are there places in Stratford that you think would be uh, less controversial than others? Any locational guidance or advice? I think right now, if, if we were to develop anything that looked like a block that had multi units, it would be met with a loud uproar. I'm not sure if it's the majority, but it's a, a loud minority. Um, the, the housing proposal that was proposed on the Christchurch property, which was aesthetically pleasing and wouldn't, would not affect um, the aesthetics of the um, Main Street or Stratford Avenue because it's tucked behind where the parking lot is was was met with such fever. I, I just really could not understand um, some of some of the objection except for the uh, historic house. That that part I most certainly understood. 
but our housing stock is we don't have rental housing available people were saying that the housing at 1111 stratford avenue and 335 Surrey boulevard is not full well 1111 Stratford Avenue is 100% full and with a waiting list. And Ferry Boulevard only has two, two bedroom units available and they're 75% leased. So people do want to, whoever's point it is, to come in and um, or move to something that they can afford. I met four people this last week, four families who have sold their houses, who are trying to downsize, either find a, sm a small house to rent or find an apartment. And I think the name of the game for us is flexibility. Mm -hmm. And maybe even, if I might add, you know, maybe the, the point, Laura, that you just made, is it more small housing, small houses, as opposed to, you know, four story, five story buildings? Um, and and you, the, 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 to answer your original question, I mean, there has been, I've overseen proposals in, you know, the far north end, in the center of town, um, Ferry Boulevard area, um, Hards Corner area, um, not so much, I don't think we've had any too much in the south end or lordship um, during my tenure, although when you talk, depending on how you define some of the neighborhoods south then, you know, there's obviously um, a different type of housing there than, than you find in other parts of Stratford. And actually, I, I forgot to mention it, but it, it was in one of my thoughts, is one thing that I think we might even want to be taking a look at um, during the duration of this partnership um, is the structures that we do have right now. Um, one of the sort of jaw-dropping items that you had in the report was the age of some of the housing that's out there. Um, you know, are some of these areas, uh, will these be, these buildings be available, be useful and up-to-date and be possible to attract uh, residents 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, or are they some of the ones that were built in the 50s, 60s, which appears to be a significant portion of them, uh, are they nearing the end of their you know, useful life without needing serious renovation um, and becoming um, some, some creating some difficulties um, later on. So as far as what's the best place to do it, it's kind of hard with a town that's built out as heavily as we are. If we were sitting, if this were the Shelton Housing Partnership, yeah, there's an awful lot of open land up there. Um, uh, Milford has has done an awful lot of building too in various parts of their town. Of course, they're spread out. I think or maybe even a little bit more than we are. Um, so it, it, it's a tough it's a tough thing. I will say that. And and you've even seen some of the developers go towards redevelopment. And I'm thinking about one of the ones on Ferry Boulevard too, as opposed to starting from brand new. Uh, Glenn, Glenn. Yeah, I listened to, uh, there's an, I'm sorry, Beth, I saw your hand up before, then I looked and it wasn't there, so is it okay if I jump in? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, sorry. Um, I listened to a seminar yesterday about something that uh, people are calling the missing middle in terms of housing. And basically what this concept is, is that housing has almost gravitated over the last 50 or 60 or 70 years, as Chris points out, to we have sort of the small single family on an individual lot, and at the other end of the spectrum, we have big projects. They're either big condominiums or big apartments or something else. And what that does is create this sort of forced choice. And what's called the missing middle are smaller types of projects where an existing single family home, uh, perhaps you know, near the center of town, might be uh, redeveloped as what they call a cottage court or a or mini apartment building. So it's a residential scale building, but it's it's carefully designed in the community so it doesn't become, you're not talking about 60 units. You may be talking about six to 12 units in a uh, narrow setting and parking would you know clearly be a, an important consideration, but there are many places where the zoning regulations don't allow that. And so that's something that we could certainly look at and identify neighbors, neighborhoods in Stratford that we think might be, um, opportunities for this. And, and rather than sort of everywhere in Stratford, it could be uh, areas on, on major roadways, state uh, arterial or collector roadways, which are uh, perhaps more accommodating to something like that. 
are you interested in learning more about this concept of the missing middle housing to see if that's a, an opportunity for us? See a couple of nodding heads. Okay, I got yes. it. I'm on it. Yeah, so, and Beth, I saw your hand. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what I was going to say is when you asked about locations, the Knights of Columbus building right across from Sterling House in the library, if that were developed into a small apartment building uh, that was handicapped accessible, that would sell out in a minute. It's right on bus routes across from the library, you know, walking distance to the Baldwin Center. That, that That's a location I can imagine. The, uh, Glenn, just to go back to your point there, the um, there was a zoning regulation. It's not on the books anymore um, for various reasons, um, but it was called um, Active Adult Housing Small Communities. Yeah. Um, and it was basically, um, there's a parcel of land on Orinoco Lane and James Farm. It's only, it's, I think it's actually a little less than an acre and the developer had suggested putting in i think it was something like 13 houses on one acre so they were very very small very hard to navigate um and eventually they they um they did not move forward with the project and we took it off the books because it, it had no it was unbuildable it was unusable at that point but the concept is almost similar to what you were just sort of thinking where and probably doesn't work on a one acre lot but maybe on something a little bit more to have, um, you know, a smaller planned type of neighborhood. And I think there's actually probably a couple of places in town that have probably um, have that kind of a feel. Um, and it, 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 it probably is more workable when you think about that as to some of the concept, because you're not talking about a five story building, you're talking about some individual homes, which still from the outward appearance, you know, appear to be uh, smaller single family, especially with an aging population and a, and a reduction in the number of occupants per house, it might be something worth looking at. And like I said, there actually was a regulation of that nature on the books a few years ago. I'm sure we could find it if we want to really look for it. I will, I will, I will talk to Smith and get that. Mm -hmm. um, just to add, um, Orange, Connecticut has something like that called Sunrise Village, but um, the prices of the homes are so uh, high there, even though they're active adult. And I'm always surprised that um, they're selling at 500 or 600 K um, where they're supposed to be active adult communities. And I'm curious to know why an active adult community would be that expensive for a senior housing. And, uh, so I've done some work in Orange. I think it's it's new construction. They're very nice units. It's close to the highway. And if people are coming from lower Fairfield County or New York, et cetera, it's easily accessible. There are many amenities in the region. So somehow it got started. And it's almost like many, for people who long history, um, Heritage Village in Southbury. You know, somebody took 1,400 acres or whatever it was in the middle of people thought was nowhere and managed to attract people from all over. So I think the right product in the right location can do wonders for people. Uh, and that could be one of them. So I'm not sure that, that that's our target market. That that development segment no. will take care of itself. Would, won't they be subsidized? Won't they be through, um, if, the, uh, if the town wanted to uh, add some subsidized units there through HUD money, through like um, housing authority, could that be possible to do an active adult community like that where it could be a little bit subsidized and affordable. Well, I think even though new construction. Share, I'll share with the committee though the, what examples of what some other municipalities have done. So the state statutes allow for a municipality to do almost anything it wants under the uh, umbrella of inclusionary zoning. And inclusionary zoning means that we uh, encourage or require people to make provision for affordable units. So as Chris pointed out earlier, we shouldn't focus on 830G, the Affordable Housing Appeals Procedure, but that requires a 30% set aside of units. The state had another program called the Incentive Housing Zone Program, which is a 20% set aside. Darien has adopted a town-wide 12% set aside. And if you don't build the unit, you have to put money into a housing trust fund, which would go to other units. So there are ways that we could uh, evaluate these types of programs and decide whether or not we think they, they might have applicability in Stratford. 
and maybe not today, but at some point in time in the future. So I think I can share that information with you as well. Okay, um, Beth, and just want to recognize you, Beth. I just want to let people know I can see on my screen Christopher, Beth, Glenn, Elizabeth, and Susmita. So if don't think I'm ignoring you. If you're not on that list, I can't see you. So I don't want to, you know, run roughshod over anybody else. But uh, Beth, uh, you have your hand up. We'll give you the floor. And you just lost your audio. She can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm oh, okay. so sorry. Got you. If there's a builder's fee, if, if there's a builder fee, that those monies can be put into a trust fund that can be used to subsidize rental costs also, correct? As long uh, as there's a nonprofit that yeah, that can I, distribute the funds? I, I think the use of the funds uh, can be capital in nature, as in funding development costs or construction costs for a new development mm -hmm. of physical units. They can be used in yes. other operational ways. So it really depends on how the housing trust fund is created. And I'll share with you some examples of what communities have done in this regard. But we, we don't have a housing trust fund going on in Stratford, do we? No, but I think we could. I'm not, I'm not aware of one. I haven't found one yet. So no. why don't you, can you tell us, just because that might lead to more research and something that might be an option, can you tell us a little bit about what a housing trust fund is and how it works? Yep. Or so housing trust. Yeah. Sorry. At least briefly, we might have to have a different pick it up in further discussion later, but just briefly. Yeah, it's a special municipal fund. It, it's generally set up uh, in municipal uh, accounting, if you will, that is uh, like most municipal uh, accounts need to be expended in the fiscal year, but there are a series of special funds which can be created, which can accumulate funds over time. So for example, I worked with New Canaan some time ago. New Canaan has a, uh, a fee of $10 per thousand of construction costs on any new zoning permit. They uh, put money into a housing trust fund, which they have used to renovate their entire housing authority's housing stock. Uh, and the units which were older and a little bit outdated, um, doubled the number of units and made a significant improvement. Now, could they have, they could have done that with perhaps funds from the state bond commission or something else, but they had the money to do the planning of what they wanted, how they wanted. So the housing trust fund is really just an accounting vehicle of a place to put money. It could be grants, it could be a municipal appropriation this year, it could be um, fee in lieu of affordable housing construction. Uh, it could be all sorts of things, um, but it becomes a dedicated fund for housing. It doesn't go to the general fund, which can be spent on anything. It's reserved for housing related things. And um, in that way, uh, we can make a clear connection between the what we're trying to accomplish and the funds that could be available for it. Glenn? Yes. Is that what Fairfield is doing or has done? Yes, I, I worked with them on their housing plan and that was one of the recommendations. It took them a couple of years, but they got it set up and I believe that's rolling at this point, yes. And that is any building that's going on. If you're building a new mansion, you're still contributing to that fund as part of your build? I'm as not part quite of your sure. Build yeah, Harold, I have not checked back with Fairfield on exactly the language of what they adopted, but I, I have followed up with New Canaan on what they adopted. If you came in because you wanted to put a stoop uh, over your back door and the building permit was for $1,000, then you put you pay $10 into the affordable housing fee as part of the application fee for that activity. So it's really anything. And if you were building a million dollar new house, you would theoretically pay 100000 for no, it, into yeah, the, I think it's probably I, yes. It's it is a uh, is a portion is proportionate to the, the amount of the fee, ten dollars per thousand. Okay. So it, it's a delicate issue. I think you know some people view it as a tax or something else like that. But the issue ends up being is that you know it's an important part of a community and our ability to be multi generational, etc. So I will get this information, and put it together for you. Okay. Yeah, the, the research that I've done on that issue, if I may, Chris, mm -hmm. please proceed. Uh, is that um, it's easy to collect the money, at least in New Jersey, 
if you look at the court cases there, it was you, you can collect the money. What the hard part is the distribution of it and having an organization that will distribute the funds in an easy and transparent way, in a fair way also. So yes, you, you can have, in essence, a tax, a surcharge for affordable housing on all developments called a development-based approach to creating affordable housing. But if those monies don't get out to people who need affordable housing, um, then it's then it ends up not being a very uh, good approach. But I think that that's a different animal than what we were talking about before, which is uh, trying to develop more housing uh, for seniors and people with disabilities. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear how that how the yeah, the distribution. Of I mean, is it subsidizing expenses or is it, you know, to purchase property for development? I, mean, I could think of different ways and I could think of all sorts of bad ways to handle. Whenever you put money yeah. out there, um, it could, uh, mm -hmm. you know, have unintended consequences and, you know, how that's administered, um, you know, whether it's through the exactly. town, through a nonprofit, through uh, somebody else. Um, that would be interesting to find out that information too, how that works. Uh, Chris, uh, yes, go ahead. If I, I like what you just mentioned, I was just thinking the same thing. How do you deploy these funds? Um, and like Beth said, it's usually easy to collect. But if if the disbursement of those funds was tied to some of the uh, projects or directives that are set by this body here, and one of them could be uh because we we identify two facts that demand for stratford housing is probably going to keep growing because we're going to keep seeing this exodus of new york residents um and our housing stock is fairly fixed to the extent that uh, we don't have any more well we don't have as many billable lots so we have two constraints there and if we as this body said as one of our objectives that every year we will disperse some funds to help with down payments to make housing, um, purchasing housing in Stratford affordable for people that need it. Uh, that could be one of the ways that we can help out. You know, because I, I think if demand keeps keeps growing and supply is limited as we're seeing, houses, housing prices are gonna keep going up. Right, um, and if we can help out with the cost of getting into a house by virtue of these uh, fees on 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 um, on permits, I think that's one way that we can help kind of uh, make some of that a little bit more affordable for people that house and maybe tag some Stratford residents, not people coming into Stratford. Say so we'll help Stratford residents by get into affordable housing maybe people that are res uh, that are renters right now or maybe seniors that are uh, you know uh, income constrained right we can help them out to get into housing that may be a little bit more affordable for them and ironically, Person, I, I i have to i have to weigh in here chris for a second go ahead so, so first of all we have no inventory so that means it's a high demand but what i'm hearing is from some people is that we, we need to mix up the inventory. In other words, if there were small in house or comp housing components for those that wanted to downsize or start up, they would re release what they're living in that would allow for other people to move here. I, I feel very, very strongly as I'm watching this heavy leveraged town because we are paying for, um, I don't want to say the sins of our fathers because that's a little too trite, but we are paying down the, our debt service for an unfunded pension liability that has been, through previous councils, has been contained and is, is being addressed. So for a, a few more years, we're, we're going to have these high taxes, but I think if we can keep on, this, on the right path and keep our community um, attractive, and I, I'm going to go back to the word vibrant again and diverse, um, I, I I think we have a lot going for us. I don't. I don't think we need to give it away, and I think, and even part away. Um, but, but, but I also think that starting with reducing fees 
um, we, can't, we can't do that right now. We can't do that right now or everybody else's taxes are going to go up. But I think, uh, Laura, one of the things that um, if, if we were to have a housing trust fund, which would be coming in from uh, payments from others, um, I know that the town of Farmington has uh, promoted uh, housing affordability by using funds that they had available to go in on a house purchase with somebody and the deal that they cut is we'll buy the land and you buy the house and then it's a land lease situation and they have over time reinvested those dollars and so now they uh, basically are sort of sharing if you will in making people don't have to buy the land. They're just buying the house. The town owns the land, so they control the sale and resale price for affordable housing. So we can think of ways to be a little bit creative on things like this if we have some dollars available. So it's just a vehicle, I think, that I don't think it's going to be the centerpiece of, of our strategies, but I think it's one that we shouldn't overlook. I wasn't talking about the fund so much, Glenn. I was more talking about the reduction of fees. And we've got, we've got Jen here, who is who is a banker, and um, can talk to us about maybe some interesting housing platforms of of loans and lending, if um, if that might be an option for new home purchasers. Yep. Yeah, I, I can certainly get us uh, get us information Jeff, on that. Want, go ahead. Uh, Jim, I, I think I accidentally cut you off. Do you want to say something? Oh no, that's okay. I said I'd be I'd be happy to research, uh, you know, lending programs and things like that that could be available to us. Okay. Um, so Smita, and then I'll come back to you, Beth, after that. But Smita. Sure. Um, some of these things that I'm mentioning, I can talk to Glenn directly, but I think it is important for the partnership to know what the concerns are. Um, so you can think through these two. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, Glenn, like um, what the mayor just said, um, and I think when we first started too, I kept uh, focusing on that, that we have to preserve the affordable housing stock in the town. And as newcomers come in, as demand rises, um, I'm, I don't want to see that we are gentrifying certain sections of the town and it, they just become um, unaffordable suddenly because you know new developments are coming in and um, their new developments and their values are definitely going to be different than the other developments in the town. So how can we preserve what we have uh, with all the outside pressures that are happening right now. The second thing I want to mention is about TOD. Uh, with all the COVID crisis and everything, and uh, people are actually beginning to question, is density going to be right in housing? Uh, and how can we ensure um, that you know we can still create a vibrant community with the right type of density um, that is also healthy for a community moving forward? Um, the third thing I want to mention is about the development permitting process. Um, I was thinking uh, recently when the center school uh, development came before the town council, I was just thinking how many processes a developer uh, has to go through when a town owned property uh, is being discussed. They have to go through a planning commission for an 8-24, they have to go to town council um, for financing details, they have to go through zoning commission for a development review, they have to go through ARB for a commercial guidelines review. So I, I think we this whole process will take at least a year for a developer. And how can we streamline the de development permitting process? Uh, because developers are usually on a strict timeline and how can we make sure some of these processes are you know working together so that they reduce the amount of time taken uh, for an applicant? and also is effective for us. The last thing I want to mention is um, about the affordable housing trust fund that you just mentioned. Um, it is a good idea, but it also has a lot of, um, you know, issues like Beth has mentioned. Um, so when we go, um, when we're about to go to a stage where we are going to present to the community, I think uh, it's, a, it's very important to weigh the pros and cons carefully before it's presented. On, in a larger setting. 
Okay. Um, Beth, you, I saw your hand. You want to? And then yeah. Chris. Yeah. Um, okay, Beth and then Chris. Sure. I just want to be clear that the document, the data that we have, does not show that Stratford has an affordable housing issue. Uh, even using some of the Bridgeport numbers, I read it that that's not what it's showing. It's showing that we have a mismatch of housing uh, and that that mismatch will grow in the future as the baby boomers age. And I really think that's what we need to be focusing on. The idea of a housing trust fund, I mean, I know about it just only because my firm did, we did a lot of work for the state of New Jersey, but uh, I don't think it's a good idea for this community because what it, would, what it would do is it would discourage a lot of renovation, which you know, many of our, our house, much of our housing stock is old and in need of renovation. So I don't think that you want to increase the cost of renovating. Beth, how would it, how would it, how would it uh, uh, limit renovation? If you're basing it on the dollar cost of a permit, uh, in, of, of the investment in the property, and you're saying that X percent or, you know, uh, uh, or, or a tenth of a percent even uh, goes, has to go into the housing trust fund, you're increasing the cost of renovating to any homeowner or to any property owner. I mean, you can structure these things in different ways. So if we were to, to go down that route, and I don't think we should, but if we were to go down that route, there are many considerations that you that you have to think about. Um, it's not a simple thing at all, but one of those considerations is who would be the fiduciary for it and how and exactly how would that work? But I, I lived at the end of Long Island and we had a land bank fund that every piece of property purchased paid into that land bank and it escalated as the amount as the amount of as the deal went got bigger it was a larger amount and a lot of people complained about it for the first couple of years sure. but after a while they stopped complaining because suddenly pieces of property started getting bought up and becoming the land bank that was hoped for that they realized this was a great asset to to my personal property values because of all this preserved lands around so I think it's partly the way it's presented uh, will affect well, no, in how. That, in, in that case, Harold, the community got to enjoy all of all of the benefits from it. In this other case, a very a limited number of people would be able to enjoy the benefits of it. I, I honestly think you can you can make a case where it's beneficial in in you know if if you don't have a fully defined fiduciary and a way to disperse the funds of course it will have issues in the implementation if we decide what it will be used for uh, very discreetly um, you know and who would manage it um, and turns on the which they will manage it i i think you kind of solve uh, many of the concerns that you have and as someone that puts in permits for renovating properties um, I think it will sting, like Harris said, probably sting in the first couple of uh, permits you put in, but then it just becomes a cost of doing business, you know, after a while. Um, I think there's, if we structure it well, there can be a lot of good that comes out of it for the residents that live here. I, I can see a problem with, say, offering this up for people from other states buying into Stratford, but if we can make a case where it benefits people that are that live here or rented here, that own here and stay here, then I think it'd be a good thing. I think it's important for us to have a vision for what we want to accomplish. And if that's a vehicle that helps us accomplish that, then we might consider it. If Just because we can doesn't mean we should. So I think uh, Beth brings up a good point. What we need to do is figure out what our vision is. And then if that becomes uh, a method for uh, supporting our overall uh, program that would be uh, something for us to discuss may i leave us with an example i have neighbors on either side of me on one side my neighbor has her house up for sale and has gotten like 25 bids over the last offers over the last week uh, because 
she lost her job. She's turning 60. She does not feel like she's going to be able to support herself with what's happening. So she is going to move up to Pioneer Village or whatever the place is in, in Southbury or someplace north of here. She's a single woman. On the opposite side of me, I have very good friends who have a 24-year-old son who just got out of college, has just taken his first engineering job. His fiance works as a gym instructor. The two of them make probably just over $70,000 a year. Neither of them feel Stratford is affordable to them. They're looking in Hamden because the combination of taxes and mortgage they feel is too much. And they think that the houses, even in the neighborhood, you know, that they could afford something under 200,000, but going up to 230 or 250 scares them. So if we had a fund like that, could a fund like that help Stratford people in, in those situations? That's not a, that's a rhetorical question. Well, I, th I think the situation, Harold, that you, you just identified is something worth noting is that as, and I think some of the, the stories you're hearing are the same things that I'm hearing, is that um, some of the folks that are coming into town, um, you know, are actually offering more money than even the sellers are asking for. And that's actually going to be driving things up, um, which is going to make things even less affordable. Um, so this is going to be another um, part of the equation that unfortunately we're going to have to be dealing with over the next time, over the next yep. uh, few years. Um, Glenn, just to sort of tie this up, we're at about an hour and 25 into the discussion and I, yep. I don't, by no means do I want to uh, you know, cut it off because this has been good and you're hearing a lot of different things um, you know, that people are hearing and this is all part of the greater equation of housing. Um, but I think maybe we should start talking about, you know, maybe what are the next steps that we want to start doing? Uh, yep. Do we feel that we have sufficient data? Is there more research that needs to be done? Uh, you know, I just want to start making sure that we have some structure as we start heading into our next group of meetings. So yep. Any thoughts on that? I do. Thank you, Chris. Um, following up from our uh, last discussion in terms of the booklet, I've already updated booklet number two. Um, to address many of the comments and issues that came up last time. I didn't want to share it with the group before this meeting because I didn't want us to go back and revisit that book um, and not have the what I thought was a very wonderful conversation here tonight. So I think uh, Smith has had a chance to look at it. Uh, I think I'm going to go through it one more time based on our conversation here tonight. Um, so you can expect from us in the not too distant future, revise book number two. Now, the purpose of this is just to show you that we're paying attention, we're trying to get the data correct, but it's not the story yet. Um, and I think the next thing that I would like to be able to do for you is take what I've heard here tonight, start to organize the information, start to identify possible strategies that are available to us so that we can now have that conversation going forward about being proactive and what types of things we might want to um, consider uh, for the future. Uh, in some cases, there are going to be things we've talked about that I sense there's already consensus in the group. I think there's some other things I'm going to push a little bit further out on, maybe to the edge of your comfort zone, and then we can talk about different strategies. And that's where I'll get feedback from you guys and say, you know what, that's, that's really not something we're particularly comfortable with. Um, and that's useful and helpful information uh, for me. So I think I'm always interested in um, taking the data to demonstrate um, our directions and our intentions. But I think at this point in time, starting to talk about the strategies and then backfilling with the data so that we make compelling cases for what it is that we're proposing and why, I think is gonna help us get a success, successful plan as we go forward. So I think uh, my next step, Chris, or my, my vision of the next step for how I can serve you best is to take the information, the discussion we've had, and start to create sort of an organizational framework. I think uh, I'm thinking of using the framework that was at the end of booklet two, the little diagram I sort of shared with everybody beforehand, yep. uh, which talks about different ages and income levels, as uh, certain strategies play really, really well for uh, 
attainable housing levels, but they really don't work at the affordable level because there we need a subsidy. So that would be a different program. But I think to show that we can fill in the blanks, we're aware of what the housing needs and situations are in Stratford and talk about how we go forward, I think will allow us to uh, improve the discussion. So how does, does that sound like a reasonable approach everybody for the next, next step? Members? Everyone? Yeah. Yeah, I like. It. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, can can I just add something? Go ahead. Uh, that Please. table, assuming that the issues are uh, affordable, attainable, or market housing, right? Rather than looking at the issue of not having appropriate housing for one's physical uh, capabilities. Yep. For social capability. So I think limiting your analysis to just that uh, is not going to address the mismatch in, yeah, I think in housing stock versus what the population needs. Thank you, Beth. I think um, that was a summary of the table, and I agree with you. Since that time, I've uh, enhanced this table to address some of the uh, challenges we find in the housing market due to short-term rentals, which really isn't a big issue, a big issue in Stratford is in some other places or housing communities or shelters and homelessness and things like that. So um, I haven't forgotten about those. I just didn't put those in the chart. So I'll make sure that those get in there in terms of our thinking going forward. Um, in terms of a meeting date for our next get together, um, should we work with Susmitha and do a doodle poll again? Does that uh, work well for people to, um i think sometime towards the end of august is that okay with people does that sound reasonable yeah yeah yes. we'll work with this method to get dates together and you can expect a doodle poll from us uh, in the not too distant future chris i don't i don't have anything else unless uh any thoughts comments from the committee would be very helpful anything else okay we'll just go around and let's just any closing thoughts i know some people have been a little quiet, but so we'll give everybody one last shot for any thoughts on just the, the, the process moving forward and any concluding remarks. So let's just go around the room, the virtual room. Christopher, you want to, any final thoughts? Um, no, no, I just I just want to say to Beth DuPont and Harold Watson that um, I really enjoyed your commentary and I learned a lot from you guys. Um, this is not my expertise level, but I appreciate all you've said tonight and I've been taking notes if you haven't seen me over there over the uh over the camera but, uh, thank you for your comments very good thank you uh, elizabeth. elizabeth any final comments no, it, was, it was a great conversation i look forward to more and i agree with all the comments and the mayor that we would like a vibrant thriving community to live in because we all you know love stratford and we want the best for it and our residents so I think that's the goal. Agreed, agreed. Uh, Susmita. Nothing. Um, we have to start thinking about when we would like to reach out to the larger uh, public and you know figure out a public engagement strategy. Maybe we can discuss that next, you know, at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why don't we put that down as a, a agenda item for because that is not as easy was in earlier days so uh, that's probably going to need some thought commissioner right. watson yes i i uh, appreciated everything i heard tonight um and i think this is a, a worthy group um i'm going to go back to what i said the last time that i would love to have glenn come to a joint planning zoning meeting where mm -hmm. Not that we're going to end up with a redrafted zoning planning uh, ordinance, but that where we really can get specific and talk about what what changes would need to be envisioned to make this work. And I don't mean from a hard-assed builder kind of way. I mean, in a way, in a sense, an ordinance that represents the coming POCD, an ordinance that represents the way Stratford would like developers and builders and buyers to look at what we think of the future of our town is 
that that if, is there a way that we could draft our ordinances in a way that say in a supportive way, not in a not in a uh, a way that just looks like another hurdle that they have to go through. I, I think that that would be a very useful thing, not just for this committee, but also for planning and zoning. So I've already said I would give up one of our meetings to Smitha mm -hmm. to do that if we could get get uh, zoning to join in with us. I'm sure we can arrange that. Yeah, we'll definitely. You bring up a great point that actually, Glenn, you have access to our zoning regulations and our um, architectural review, all those materials, correct? Yes, I do. So Smith has shared a lot of materials with me. So yes, I, have, I believe I have all of them. And is my, is my request premature? I don't know yet, Harold. I mean, I think the issue would be that um, it's important for us, I think, to start to get a basic framework together that people can react to. So whether it's public input, I mean, if we were in a non-COVID world, I think public input involves bringing people in the beginning so that you can understand their thoughts and concerns and then bringing ideas back to them to get their thoughts and feedback. In a COVID well, world, it's harder to do that because people don't always have something to react to. And so it's kind of less structured, less formal. So, I mean, I think at this point in time, I'll work with Smitha on ideas for our next meeting to talk about community engagement and what we do in a COVID world or a non-COVID world. Um, and I think getting together with the planning commission, I think I'll work with Smitha to talk to uh, both zoning and planning to uh, figure out what the right timing is. Um, and we'll, we'll move ahead with that. Okay. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, Beth. Closing remarks. Uh, no, not really. I just want to make, I, my goal is to make sure that we have, I agree with the mayor, a vibrant community and a community that uh, that works for people of all situations and all capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Hoydick. Thank you, Chair. I'm really, I'm really excited. Um, I love the dialogue. It makes me think differently, which I think is um, it's exciting, it's invigorating, um, and I'm hopeful, hopeful it will be motivating to the rest of our, our population that decides to engage with us. Um, I think after the next meeting, it might be, as we have a little bit more of a framework, or and I don't want to say a direction like a solid path, but, you know, where exactly we think we're going to go and then have the meeting with the land use boards because um because otherwise it's discussion which will be very very valuable discussion but it's discussion that's pretty open-ended instead of yeah. maybe directed a little bit more so that that's just my 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 thought on that um i'm really interested in the data and i'm really really interested in getting feedback from the residents, but again, with the same thing as, as with the land use board, I think we have to have a general idea where we want to go because, I mean, we did a lot of feedback um, and information gathering on center school and um, look look what happened. The proposal was just not what the community or the council wanted. So now we're, you know, even though the data was good and we should use it to jump forward, and maybe we can do some different kind of small unit housing that is not as dense if that's what people don't want. But um, for a year and a half, and we had to wait part of that down because of COVID, um, we kind of stalled a little bit. So I would rather move slowly at first and kind of get our feet underneath us and then um, really launch. But thank you all for your participation. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Desmond. Final thoughts? Uh, yeah, so really enjoyed the conversations and hearing all the perspectives um, today. I think this is really good. Um, you know, you come into this thing with your own perspective and your own ideas of what you think it's to look like. And you find out there are other demographics that, uh, that need to be considered. So really excited to see how this, uh, this process plays out and, and we, hopefully come up with a solution that kind of addresses the needs of the different people that we've discussed today. So uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. And Jennifer, you're the last one. Okay. Or Mary, Mary I forgot Mary. Jennifer, then Mary. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what everyone has said. This was a great discussion. I always learn a lot uh, at these meetings. Uh, this is not my area of expertise either, but um, certainly uh, learning a lot and uh, it's you know really exciting and I can't wait to see what uh, we can accomplish as a team. Okay, thank you. And Mary Dean. Hi, I thought it was such a productive meeting and loved everyone's ideas and I'm really excited about the fact that you know wh where we're how far we've come and where we can go and it'll just be so much easier in economic development if we have a plan and um, you know get enough feedback from the community so that moving forward you know the things the 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 housing that we need is also something that will be accepted by you know our Stratford residents so I'm really excited about this excellent okay yeah I, I want to thank everybody for their participation and and I, I echo the sentiments here it's great to hear different perspectives um, from people that are exposed to lots of different facets of the of the of the issue and I think that's going to be a, a definitely a strengthening factor as we move forward and uh, yeah I think what the, the, the challenge for us will be to you know figure out what we want to tackle and um, you know make sure that we have some actionable goals and uh, you know set ourselves on the path to uh, to getting there and, and making sure that we, we can make a uh, a difference in this issue and um, you know and, and engage the public too one in whatever way we can do that so so I thank everybody for their um, patience in the discussion and the willingness to continue participating as as we move forward okay great thanks everybody thank you very much okay we'll take a thank motion you. to adjourn motion thanks, to adjourn please. No. is there a second 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 okay I heard it heard I heard I heard second from Beth. I wasn't sure who the mover was. Esmond, I'll move. Esmond, okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Carries unanimously. Aye. We are adjourned at 740. Have a pleasant evening, everyone, and look forward to uh, look forward to uh, our next session. All right, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.